This is Golf with Jay Delsing. A two-time All-American at UCLA. A participant in nearly 700 PGA Tour events. Seven professional wins to his credit. Over 30 years of professional golf experience. A member of the St. Louis Sports Hall of Fame. This is Golf with Jay Delsing. Away we go with Golf with Jay Delsing on a Sunday morning here on 101 ESPN. Coming to you from the Car Shield Studios, always presented by Darty Business Solutions with Jay Delsing. I'm Dan McLaughlin. Our guest today will be Jim Hackenberg. And you have seen this when you've been on a range or playing golf, getting loose. He is the founder of Orange Whip and Orange Whip Training. So we're going to visit with Jim Hackenberg. And also, you have heard him time and again, whether it's the shows on 101, certainly on Blues Hockey, and that is Joey Vitale. So before we get into all that, Jay Bird, always great to see you. Danny, good morning. Great to be with you. Yeah, we got a couple more great guests. We got a Joey from the hockey world. We got Jim Hackenberg, who's been a buddy for a while. Uh, great training device. I love the orange whip. Got one in my bag. It's uh, super fun. I think it can uh, really help people, but we got a lot, lot more than that to even talk about. Dave. Absolutely. And this past week, Greg Norman coming out talking about the world golf rankings. I can already see it. You're shaking your head. Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't know, man. I know the guy loves a microphone and I know I, I just, I don't here. So here's what I did. D I'm going to read this quote off and it's, um, it's it's interesting because first of all, before I read this quote off, no one is saying John Rahm doesn't de- deserve to be ranked in the top ten. Joaquin Neiman shouldn't be in the top ten or twelve or whatever. And the same with some of these other great players over there. No one's saying that. Here's the deal: you don't break away from a pre-existing long time standard, the standard league and expect to get credibility right away. Just doesn't happen. So here's, this was about a year ago when the ruling came out when, you know, because there's been all this complaining about, oh, we we are being so mistreated. Here's what, here's, here's a significant quote. The important point is, this is not about players. Live players are self-evidently good enough to be ranked. No one doubts that, says Peter Dawson, chairman of the official World Golf Rankings Board. This is about a tour whose formats are so different and whose qualification criteria are so different. Can they be ranked equitably with the other tours that already conform to the official golf world golf ranking norm and is live a closed shop that's what this is about so what does norman do at the end of last year he they concoct this very limited qualifying tournament where they let three people in really the other part is this no cuts playing three days no cuts how do you really justify that when you're thinking of world golf rankings and competition d you've yeah. already paid these guys exorbitant amounts of money and now here's the other thing that i'm still wondering when joaquin when joaquin neiman won last week and they're playing again in hong kong when he did he actually get a check an additional check for four million, or does that go against his draw? I think it is an additional check. And if I'm a player, I don't know how you say no to live right now with the kind of money that they're throwing out there. Now there are certain guys that have said no. Spieth, JT. Uh, you look at uh, Morica- Scotty. Sh- Morica- yeah, yeah, all of those guys. To- totally. At what point though do they say, "I can't do this anymore"? These guys are offering me two hundred million dollars. I got to jump. Right. I don't know. I don't know because here's the thing. Here's what I do know, and I do know for sure. The more that you leave him, the the head of the PIF, yes, sir, you leave him out, the more he's devising an additional splash, Danny, that's going to blow this thing up even further. There has to be some sort of agreement, whether it's two years, whether how they figure it out, I don't know. But... We've talked about this before, and I hope the listeners aren't completely sick of hearing it, but it's not dissimilar to the WHA and the NHL. 
to the NFL and the AFL and the NBA and the ABA. And they got past it. Hopefully golf can get past it. I look forward, Danny, to being alive in a day when John Rahm is playing against Scotty Scheffler and Jordan uh, Spieth and JT and all the other boys all in one event every damn week. So you were ranked as high as 51st in the world, correct? Yes. At that point, Liv is going to come to you with a significant yes. amount of money. Yes. So you would have taken yes. it. <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, my gosh, I got four daughters, and I think you just, I mean, I would have thought long and hard, long and hard about it. I mean, I you got to remember, Danny, we didn't get to play for any of the bit we Towards the very end of my career, we got Tiger money in the purses. We didn't get to the 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 year that I um, finished the highest on the money list. I think I made three three hundred thousand dollars. So hell, don't get me wrong, hell of a lot of money, but it's not three million. I mean, last year on the PGA Tour, we had one hundred and thirty nine guys make over a million dollars. Is that right? One hundred thirty nine. Right. Wow. So, so I was fifty something. And made 300. So that's the scale of it all. It's, you know, and if you get your PGA Tour card now, the way they've got it written down, you've got a uh, $500,000 cushion just waiting for you. So if you have some sort of horrible year and you only make, you know, 150,000, the tour gives you 350. That's amazing. And then you're not even including the endorsements on top of that by getting your PGA uh, Tour card. Exactly right. And I mean, those have all those have all gone up exponentially as well. So, I mean, it is a great time to be playing professional golf in terms of money. But I got to tell you who I think is really concerned. I think Tiger Woods is really concerned about where in the hell this thing goes next. Because, Danny, if they create a world tour, which is definitely on the table, what does that do? to the Tiger Woods era that was just before that where he has 82 wins. What if, though, he wins, gets one more win, and these guys are involved, every player, the best players in the world? Yeah. I don't think that detracts from what he's done and you included in what he's done. No, it doesn't. You're 100% right. I'm sorry. I said that totally the wrong way. It doesn't detract what he's done. But if you start eliminating events like, just pick one, Milwaukee, the Milwaukee Open, where it's Tiger's very first tournament he ever played in. Or, uh, you know, the John Deere, which he also played. You're going to eliminate those because now we're going to have the Singapore Open and the Buenos Aires Open, and we're going to Panama, uh, and I'm picking Costa Rica. Sure. Who, who the hell knows? But all of a sudden, we've got – you're only going – these top players are only going to play so much. It's always the way it's been. They, d- they never play m- much more than 22 events – they're scheduled permitting. That's just what it looks like. The rest is downtime, family time, all these ob- other obligations. All of a sudden, D, it changes the entire landscape moving forward. You know, now all of a sudden, Scotty Scheffler says, okay, we got this unification and we've got, it's called the PGA World Tour. And now I'm only playing 14 times in the United States. D, it changes everything. Yeah. And it's, so it makes significant. All of a sudden, the Byron Nelson tournament down in Atlanta, in Dallas, doesn't mean anything anymore. And so I'm, I'm, it just, it, and, and there's going to be some change, and that's inevitable. And that's, I don't have a problem with. But what it all looks like, Tiger Woods is concerned. I'm telling you, not on the major championship side. He wishes he had 19 and not 15. But the others, it's, it's going to change. Could you imagine in your playing career standing over a five-foot putt and having to do that on the PGA Tour as opposed to an event that has no cut? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I mean, right. You, the right. pressure that you get. You're, these guys are getting paid so much on live. It's kind of like, well, yeah, if I finish six as opposed to third, maybe I drop a little bit. But the money is so significant, it really doesn't matter. Could Does you it really spend matter? it all? Exactly. You know, the way you and I live, we couldn't spend it all. No. I mean, we'd love to take a try it, you know, so we buy a nicer truck than we have now. No. We I'm still, happy with what I got. Right? I mean, I'm still going to wear a sweatshirt, T-shirt, shorts, going to be do, doing the same thing I do, playing golf with you and hanging out with our buddies. It's, it's, it's like John Rahm said before he went. He goes, if I add another $200 million to, is it going to change my lifestyle? No. And then they added... 400 million talk to it. And he's like, 
Yeah. Yeah, it does change yeah, a little no, bit. No, it does change it. It's just, there's something about human nature, Danny, it just won't let you go. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's a and, good and, point. And, and I don't, I don't, that's not my issue. Just quit complaining about this stuff and, and have a little... Read the room and understand what you're talking about here. The PJ Tour has been existing since the 60s. You're not going to start up this league and expect to be on equal footing. And your crazy, weird shotgun start, 54 holes, no cut. Team play. And you, how many guys? What do you like out of live? I do like it, the, the team play, the I, team format. You. I do too, and I think... Hell, I think you and I could de- even you and I could develop and sell that. I mean, you get if you were unified, and you say, I mean, how many teams could we create? D, if you say we're going to work out of the of 125 players, so you create 30 some odd teams. Denny, it's an NHL, it's an yeah, NBA, it's be fun. You could have a blast with that. You could, you could. Um, regionalize them you could look and 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 sell you could have their own gear they could have their own logos they could have their own names and then you could have different owners and different events for team events you could have it where hey the team the shooters are coming out you know to st louis and they're going to put on a clinic and who's on the shooters team you got tiger woods you know justin thomas x y and z and they're going to be here all you know wearing their team logos i think that's cool am i crazy to think that there's maybe a two to three year timetable, and they figure this thing out. I'm hoping that's all it is, D. I'm with you. I, well, we're both crazy. We both know that, but <laughs> I'm thinking uh, that's what I'm hoping as well. Uh, that there's going to be enough money on both sides of this table that the the sting of allowing the live players to come back is going to be lessened because of all this money that the Fenway group just dumped on the tour. So hopefully yes and then for the betterment of the game for the for the true growth of the game as live talks about for the true growth of the game there's this unification and it all goes back under one umbrella. I know you're trying to get Greg Norman on our show. I am. And what would be the one question, just one, if you could ask him what do you think that I because I know mine, mine would be simply why? I was thinking the same thing. Like why why what and drove I, you to do this? Why? I could tell you. I got to play with him a couple of times. I got to hang out with him when we were on the Fox and uh broadcast team. And he's he's got an unbelievable personality. He's got a lot of charisma. He's got he just has this different, in my opinion. It's almost like a switch, Danny, that that takes him from, oh, I'm hanging out with one of the guys to, oh, no, I'm a Hall of Famer. And we're like, oh, no, no, you're hanging out with the guys and you're a Hall of Famer. Sure. Not one or the other. You're still with. And so why? Because he has been pissed that he didn't get to play wherever he wanted to his entire career. And the funny thing is, here's a guy that's won, what, 99 tournaments around the world or something, D. A, a great champion. Only not not nearly as significant here in the U.S. as he could have been. He's blown a lot of really big events. Let's sure. just say that. Sure. But he still won two majors and, and 19 events here on tour. But he was always – he's from Australia. He's always traveled. You know, when you grew up in Australia, you play the Australian tour. But, Danny, that's so small. And it's – you know, a handful of events. So you're con- you're automatically going to the European Tour. That's where everybody went first because most of the players weren't good enough to go from Australia straight to the U.S. So they play, and then all of a sudden, you know, they they the um, Australian sport, uh, the Minister of Sport created this golf program down there, and all of a sudden they started churning out really good players and that didn't that wasn't the case anymore then the kids went from growing up in australia to playing over here in the university you know so they'd come to our our colleges play college golf and then turn pro and they're ready to go so there's been that little transformation but greg was always this world traveler and it's like no i want to play this week in orlando and i want to play next week in portugal and then i want to go over and i want to play over in new zealand and 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 i want to go wherever i want so he feels burned a little bit by the PGA Tour. Definitely. Yeah. Which That's, is amazing because we're talking about untold amounts of yeah. 
dollars that the tour has given him a platform to play on. And and really, it's not for the betterment of the game. This has been for the betterment of him in a lot of ways, and he's using the money and the players because he's frustrated and been upset about his past to use this for personal gain in many ways. Is that fair to say? I, I think it's fair to say, and I, I got to tell you, what's interesting is that as much money as he has, he doesn't have enough money to do this. And he went and thought Rupert Murdoch, who is extremely well healed, would support the world tour back in the 90s, and Rupert wouldn't do it either. And so he finally found himself, you know, the fountain of unlimited resource. And and do these guys care about making money? I mean, if you do this from a business model, Danny, it's it doesn't work. You're going to have to be in the business for tens of years before you start seeing any sort of positive return on your dollar the way they're going. So three decades for you on tour, and then you think about <clears throat> your career at UCLA, playing with tour players that eventually became tour players, and then your career afterwards. So what are your contemporaries saying about what's happening right now? How concerned are they with this? Does it upset them? Do some does. guys say, eh, whatever. Where, where are they at with this? For the most part, nobody likes it. They just don't like the splinteredness of the game. They don't like – I can tell you that I've gotten several, multiple, multiple calls from older folks going, what do we get? Sure. And I said, uh, we're getting nothing. <laughs> right. And they're like, no, what – what?" I'm like, I'm not saying that's necessarily fair. I, I didn't do anything to deserve any money now, right now, but we did give, you know, 700 so events or something like that. And it, what, whatever you, you put forth in a lot of years of supporting the brand. And, and I honestly, it wasn't until now that I ever even had this, a slight bit of negative idea about what the PGA Tour was. And I just think, Man, I I just don't like where we're going. There's Danny. We're void of leadership right now. Jay Monahan, I actually like this man. I have no idea how he's staying in 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 t- on top as our commissioner. He makes a huge amount of money. He's going to walk away with a massive pile of dough. But the the boardroom down at the PGA Tour has got to be in shambles. It's just got to be a wreck. And um, I know. We talked to our, uh, I, I've been talking to my, our buddy Seth Wall, who came on the show and he said he'd come on again. He's such a great guy. So connected. He said, just rest assured, there's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes, but he goes, it's the boardroom's a mess right now. Does the PGA tour, as we wrap up this first, uh, first segment, does the PGA tour need right now, JT Spieth, Scheffler, a big name to win a tournament because we're hearing about all these first time winners, guys that are just getting on tour in competition on Sunday, having a chance to win. I think the PGA tour for them, they need a win out of a big name coming up. Danny, our sport thrives when we've got that, that man here, that, that lead dog, you know, Arnold Palmer for years, Jack Nicholas, the Tom Watson era, Lee Trevino, Greg Norman, Tiger Woods, that we, we thrive in that. And right now the world golf rankings are, are so screwed up because of what Liv's done. Scotty Scheffler, world number one for sure, but he might be the most obscure Never hear number about one him right player now. in the world. You never hear about no, him right and, now. And he he can't putt. He's, he had just a horrible putting week at, at L.A., but I think he's playing this week. I know he's playing this week at the Arnold, Arnold Palmer Invitational, which is such a great event and such a tribute to the King and such a fun place to be. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. By the way, I got one more thing. You got to tell the story about when you first met the King. Uh, uh, so, I... I'm I'm down at Orlando and I'm I'm working with my my dear friend Jim Deaton who is the director of golf and working for Arnold Palmer at Bay Hill, and we're sitting on the range and I'm hitting balls and he's watching me and AP comes up which is such a thrill amazing just him standing there you know so I wanted to hit good shots you know and I wasn't hitting it very well so I'm like come on man let me you know <laughs> let me figure something out here and he says what are you doing tomorrow and I said I think I'm pretty open. And You'll find said, a way to be open. I know. Well, I was hoping he was going to say what he said. He goes, what about, what about, about 
you know, 1030, quarter to 11, I said, just tell me where. Yeah. How I, I may not sleep tonight. And he's like, yeah, let's, let's play if you'd like to play tomorrow. And I'm like, yeah, that's fantastic. So, oh, man, I get to I, – I, I walked up to the D and I seriously felt so anxious, so How'd you nervous. Play? My, huh? How'd you play? Oh, I played well. I okay, was, good. Oh, the first tee shot, man. I was like, calm, calm down. It's a Tuesday, you know, right. and and, and uh, I just smashed one. But he, he, just listening to him tell the stories, he's so engaging. He walks down with you, and you feel like you've known him your whole life. I uh, I love your story, though, about, and I think about this any time that I'm in a room that has a roof on it, and if I'm eating something, I I think of myself, Jay told me that story about the king telling him, take your hat off. Make sure you take that's your hat terrible. off. That's where I was going with this. So he gives... I get an exemption in his tournament, and I had played late on Thursday, early on Friday, and I had a good so so good first two days, and I'm up in the top ten or twelve or something. And he, I I'm sitting there, and I got my hat on, and we're at the players' dining, and it's a beautiful spread of food, you know, and desserts and all this, and I'm just you know sitting there by myself, and this big meat hook hits me on the left shoulder and I look at it and I turn around and it's, you know, Mr. Palmer, the King. And I'm, and I, and I, um, I stand up and I, and he said, Hey, nice playing. And I, and I said, yeah, thank you. And, I, and thank you for this, you know, this room and all this food. And I mean, and getting me in the tournament and, and he goes, yeah, no problem. And then he pulls me in there tight and I'm like, uh Oh, cause he was, sque- you know, the guy is strong as heck. And he, he grabs me right under the kind of armpit in that little soft part of my arm. And he said, let me ask you something. Do you wear your hat in your home? At, and when you're at home, do you wear your hat inside? And I thought, yes, sir, Mr. Palmer, I do. And he goes, damn it, stop doing that and take that hat off. And I, so I grab my hat and I, I mean, I'm 12 shades of red right now. Yeah. And I'm like, and he said, this is my home. You don't wear your hat in anyone's home. Show me some respect. How about that? Well, do you, you, you must have been say, floored. Well, I was mortified. Yeah. And I thought, oh, man. And then I'm looking around I'm like, boy, I sure as hell, hell nobody saw me. <laughs> you know, so I obviously I take my hat off. To this day, I walk in the golf shop at Norwood. I walk in the golf shop at Bell Re- anywhere, and I take my hat off. And I and I I I try not to wear my hat inside ever, and I probably have. But so this is funny. So. I sit down. He goes, sit down. Enjoy the rest of your lunch. And I'm like, I can't eat now, man. My stomach is so upset. And he passed me on the shoulder and says, good luck on the weekend. I hope you'll win this damn thing. And I said, yeah, me too. And I'm sitting there going, Whew. and so I don't, I don't, D, I don't think I ate anything the rest of that meal. <laughs> and I was sitting there and I had uh, Jess Lumen and Willie Wood came up to me different times. And they say, uh, they said, um, hey, um, King got you, didn't he? Oh, and man. I said, did you see that? And he goes, yeah. He goes, he got us too. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, our generation, we just wear, I don't know, we pop our hats on, and my dad never told me no. to take my hat off anywhere. I mean, obviously wouldn't wear it to church or something like that, but yeah, so, oh, I, I mean, you want to talk about, I mean, I was 35 years old, sure. you know, thinking, I'm, I'm okay, I'm you know, got a little lunch and all this, and no, it was not. It was not good. That is Jay Delsing. I'm Dan McLaughlin. It's golf with Jay Delsing. Coming up, Jim Hackenberg will be our guest, founder of Orange Whip and Orange Whip Training. Something you might want to listen to in terms of what you put in your bag. We hope that'll be the case. Jim Hackenberg is coming up. I'm delighted to welcome the Amateur Players Tour to the Golf with Jay Delsing show. The APT team has worked so hard to establish a national golf tour for amateurs. Folks, don't miss out on this opportunity. If you love golf and ever wondered what all the fuss about tournament golf is, then this tour is for you. We just released the 2024 schedule and it is a beast. There's 21 events currently in the metropolitan st louis area with many more to come but check out these golf courses paynes valley ozark national stone wolf ambrier persimmon woods gateway national and a 36 hole event on norwood's west course and many more okay so the courses are certainly cool and nice but what's really neat is the way the events are run and how they are run 
The APT team does a fantastic job of closely monitoring handicaps and ensuring a good and fair competition. There are five divisions, a year-long points competition, major championships, elevated events, and much, much more. Right now, there are over 6,000 members in 41 different local chapters across the country. And all that's happened in just over five years. Join now and don't miss out on the best tournament golf in the country. Run for amateurs by amateurs themselves. Go to amateurplayerstour.com. That's amateurplayerstour.com. Get ready to watch the legends of golf up close when they compete at historic Norwood Hills Country Club right here in St. Louis. The Ascension Charity Classic will be back again with some of golf's greatest names. Steve Stricker, Padraig Harrington, John Daly, David Duvall, Bernard Longer, Justin Leonard, David Toms, and more will compete returning September 3rd through the 8th. Visit ascensioncharityclassic.com for information. Are you driving an out-of-warranty car? It's only a matter of time before your out-of-warranty vehicle is in the shop costing you thousands of dollars. Auto repair costs are up nearly 20% from last year, which is four times the rate of inflation. If an unexpected breakdown happened today, would you be ready for that? Well, now you can be with a plan through CarShield. Even if your car is just over three years old, it's still prone to expensive costs. Your car is more than just getting you from point A to point B. Traveling by car is a way of life. From picking up your kids to going to a new restaurant, cars are a daily essential. When you enroll in a car protection plan through CarShield, you can look forward to the following. The price will never go up no matter how many claims you file or no matter how high the mileage on your car increases. CarShield offers protection plans that start as low as $100 per month. That's $100 per month. They have repair coverage for up to 5,000 different parts of your vehicle. Plus, when your car breaks down and you're stuck on the side of the road, you get 24-7 coast-to-coast roadside assistance. You also get complimentary towing and rental car options. CarShield has my back when my car breaks down, and they can have yours too. Call CarShield today at 800-465-6550 or visit carshield.com. It's CarShield, proud sponsor of the Golf with Jay Delsing Show. Hi, this is Peter Jacobson, and you're listening to Golf with Jay Delsing. Darty Business Solutions has been enhancing the business of our customers for the last 37 years. How do we do it? Through our expertise in technology, better use of data and analytics, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. We roll up our sleeves and collaborate. We build applications and effectively communicate with our partner clients to bring their goals and objectives to the finish line. Our award-winning Access Point program is a community game changer. With nearly 100 students in the program, mostly young African-American females are making between $55,000 and $60,000 per year right out of high school. That's right, $55,000 to $60,000 a year right after high school graduation. That's when they begin their training. CEO Ron Darty believes the talent is equally distributed, but access to that opportunity is not. So here's Access Point, providing more and more opportunity for those in and around our community. It's Darty Business Solutions. This is the Front Nine, presented by the Ascension Charity Classic. To learn more, visit ascensioncharityclassic.com. Golf with Jay Delsing on this Sunday morning on 101 ESPN. Along with Jay Delsing, I'm Dan McLaughlin. And we have Jim Hackenberg, the founder uh, founder of Orange Whip and Orange Whip Training. So, Jay, anytime you walk on a range, you're seeing somebody with the Orange Whip. A hundred. And it's been a, quite a while. Jim, thanks so much for joining us. Tell us when the Orange Whip first came out because I've been seeing these in bags all over the country for years. I introduced it January of 2008 at the PGA show in Florida, and that's when I first showed it. And it was it was kind of funny because that first version 
you could tell I made that in my garage, but people like the feel of it. So it, it started right at that point. For somebody that doesn't know, describe the orange whip and what it is. Sure. It's about the length of a golf club, let's say a driver. And instead of a club head, we have a heavy orange ball, heavier than a, than a golf club head. Uh, the shaft is flexible like a fishing rod, so very flexible. And on the other side, the grip end, we have a counterbalance. And it's a very heavy counterbalance. But what uniquely happened was this counterbalance balances out the weight of the orange ball. So if you were to balance the orange whip in the middle of the shaft on your finger, it perfectly balances. And that's really what I, I, I figured out was that this is what allows people to swing in rhythm, on balance, on plane, because it's counterbalance effect that I now have patented on the orange whip, and I'm very proud of that. You should be, Jim. How the hell did you figure that out? Because you're exactly right. The counterbalance on the orange whip makes the a world of difference for people to be able to swing that, to feel the club load, and to work on the rhythm and balance. So I, I'm a golf fanatic, and I read and study a lot, and I learned that Jack Nicholas and Ben Hogan used to counterbalance their clubs. They didn't tell anyone. It's perfectly legal, but they didn't tell anyone because they felt that that was the secret. That was the, the idea. So when I was coming up with this idea for the Orange Whip, this rhythm tool, I thought, I'm going to counterbalance this because those guys were pretty good. So maybe they knew <laughs> something. And I, uh, I went ahead and just kept experimenting with different amounts of weight on each end. And through trial and error, when I evenly balanced it, when I would swing it, when my other golf pro friends of mine, even the guy I caddied for on tour, they all liked it best when it was evenly balanced. So that was it. That was when I decided I'm going to make it perfectly balanced. Jim Hackenberg is our guest, founder of Orange Whip and Orange Whip Training. The reaction of people that use this, whether they're on the tee or at home, what, what's the kind of reactions that you get? Well, what it is is many people see it and they've watched people swing it, but they don't really know what they're doing. So when I have a chance to spend just even a couple minutes with someone, what I'll do is I'll just have them slowly start swinging it back and forth, almost like a, a putting stroke that, that gradually goes to a pitching motion that goes to a three-quarter swing, and then eventually their full swing. Once they can do this back and forth, like a child on a swing set, just continuing to go, and they're staying balanced, they're in good rhythm, then I encourage them to pick up the pace and let them figure out how to do that. And what happens then is you start to see the light bulb going off. They start to go, oh, oh, I feel this. I know that. I, I like that feeling. So it's, it's a gradual buildup, but once they got it in rhythm, then I encourage them to pick up the pace because then it's more resembling what their golf swing would, what they want to have, what they want to see. Jim, let's, let's, let's peel back just a, a little bit and talk a little bit about your history because you played college golf you, you're, uh, you've caddied on the PGA tour. Uh, it's, it's a fascinating story. Take us through that a little bit, please. Sure. Well, from the very beginning, I grew up in Grand Forks, North Dakota. So it was snow for six months. And no one in my family played golf. I was number eight of nine kids. My parents did not play, and my brothers and sisters did not play. I was fortunate to be introduced to the game by some neighbor kids who would play golf with their dads. So I just started going hanging around with them at this nine-hole course that was near our house. And almost immediately I go, this is the game for me. I like it. So I got into golf. I grinded and worked as hard as I could in those five, six months of summer. And then I, I, I progressed progressed pretty quickly. I read a lot of books. I was very technical and I studied a lot, but I got better and better. And I was, it was my whole life was to get, you know, to be a better player. I then moved to Arizona after high school, took a year off from college or just any schooling. And I worked all day at a golf course where I'd work half the day, play and practice the other half. That was my whole life. The very next year at Arizona state, I was a walk on to the ASU golf team in the fall of 1988. And Phil Mickelson was a member of that, that team. He, he came in as a, as a freshman. So I had a chance to play with Phil for a year and a half at ASU. But they're a tremendous team, and it's hard to break into their top five. I, there's 12 guys on the team. So I, uh, I ended up making the team but wasn't traveling. Well, I wanted to travel and play, but I was questioning if I'd be able to travel with that squad. So our assistant coach became head coach at Oregon State. And at Oregon State, I transferred up and played for him for two and a half years and had a great Pac-10 experience, and I really enjoyed it. And then I, I like many players, I tried to pursue it on, on the mini tours. I didn't really have the short game to get to the next level, and that would really be my falling out. So I started teaching golf, staying in the golf business, 
And a good friend of mine, Patrick Moore, who I grew up with from North Dakota, and he went on to be an All-American at North Carolina, he, uh, he asked me to caddy for him on tour when he got out there. And really, it was that introduction to the PGA Tour, watching the best swings every day, that I started to realize that maybe golf isn't all technique. Maybe it isn't all control. Maybe there's something different. There's a rhythm. There's a motion. But how do you, how do you teach somebody that? And that was the very intro to me trying to figure out how do I get myself as well as my students to swing in this rhythm and the balance that the Jeff Ogilvy's have, that the Ernie L's have, that the Tom Watson have. I mean, they have all these wonderful swings. And it was really just pondering that day in and day out while watching on the range that I came up with the Orange Rip concept. Jim, how does it uh, compare for a high handicapper to use this and the scratch golfer? I'm assuming both can use it, but how does it work for both of them? So the, the, the scratch player will immediately get a feel for it and get it into rhythm because it's going to be close to what they already do. So they would see it as more of like a warm-up tool and trying to you know find that rhythm for the day. The high handicapper... It feels like, uh, especially if I haven't given them a good introduction, if they just grab it and start moving it, they're trying to force it and throw it and pull it and tug it and do everything with it. And it throws them off balance and they go, what is going on? I don't understand this. So they're trying to force it like they do with their golf club. What I try to encourage them to do is just gradually let it build up almost like a, a pendulum would, where it's just slowly going back and forth. And then once you get to a larger range of motion, then you can start to add pace. But that's my lesson for the higher handicappers. Let's not add any pace to this until you can get it into a rhythm that's going back and forth comfortably and you're allowing the motion to develop. So there's a little more of a learning curve for the higher handicapper, but they'll get it and they'll get it pretty quick once they accept that they're not trying to chop at something or slam down on something, they're swinging something. And the beauty is for, for all those types of players, good or bad, the more you use it, the better it is, and it's never something you necessarily get tired of. It's not like a, a gimmicky thing that you try for three days and then you put it in the corner of your garage. It's something people keep around their trunk of their car or their golf bag every day. And for me, I, I, I don't live in North Dakota any longer, but if I did have one of those when I was a kid, I'd be swinging it in the garage every day, and I would never lose my golf swing. And it would, I'd be ready for spring golf the moment uh, the snow disappeared. Why don't you live in North Dakota? No, that's for a different show. We'll talk about that later. So, Jim, <laughs> one of the one of the things that I love that you said is that the 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 scratch hand golfer is going to pick this up because the lag and the way that they already know how to kind of load the shaft naturally in the swing, where. Um, a higher handicap per se is going to do so, a lot of casting and kind of get their body moving out of sequence. And what the orange whip does is it almost takes care of that for them because the, the, the way the counterbalance works and the flexibility of the shafts, it loads itself. If you get it in the position that you're looking for. Exactly. And it's a feeling that, that I can't, ex it's difficult for me to express the feeling, but when they feel it, that's when they understand. And the beauty is this, is that you could take the smartest scientist who understands physics to a total degree, and they would be able to, once they feel it, they would be able to explain it. But on the flip side, I could take a caveman and I could have them swing it. And because they're athletic, once they figure it out, they can do it. So again, I'm very proud that it's not only the scientists can explain it, but the caveman can appreciate it. So I like that it you don't have to fully understand it, but once you feel it, that's when you, uh, you you comprehend it. Jim, one of the things that I think is super cool as well is that you've developed this this Orange Whip light speed. So in today's game, and for those that are trying to get to the next level, speed is what everybody's talking about. And you've got something that's a speed trainer as well. Yes. So the orange ball on the, on the traditional Orange Whip is 10 and a half ounces. On the light speed, we have a three ounce ball. It's much smaller, it's much lighter, but the rest of that club is the same components. It's the same flexible shaft, same grip and same heavy counterweight. So let's look at it like this. Let's look at it like a sprinter. Somebody's training to be a fast runner. What a lot of times they will do is they'll run up a hill to work on their strength, their, their, their sequencing and how their body moves and their power. When they get to the top of that hill, they turn around and they run down it to get comfortable going fast because you've got to be comfortable going fast and running down a hill is getting comfortable with that. So the orange whip 
original is is like running up a hill. You're sequencing, you're training, you're getting ready. The orange with light speed is like running downhill to get comfortable with speed. So you mentioned 10 and a half ounces. And how long is this? Give us the specs on the various models that you have. So the orange whip trainer, which is our longest version, is 47 inches long, but we have a, a counterbalance. It's a, you know, almost an inch and a half. So it's a little over 45 where you would grip it, which is about driver length. But that's still maybe a little long for some players. So we also have the midsize, which is 43 inches. And let me talk about those two for just a second. The I, I designed the original orange drip trainer, the 47 inch long one, because most of the people I was wanting to help were the over the top slicers. So the longer it is, the more apt they uh, they because it's longer, they'll have to wait for it. They'll have to let it lag, and it's harder for them to come over the top on it. Um, so that was that pur- purpose. But then I started meeting tour players and other players, and even if they're tall. Sometimes the longer version, they don't want to flatten out anymore. They don't want to get it too far inside because they don't have that problem. So our midsize became a very good model for a lot of players who don't struggle with the slice. So it's not out. Those two versions, I think every golfer needs one of the two. And it doesn't always mean height, but height is another factor for the 43-inch because, you know, that it just some people, it's too long. So I, I look at it as a height fact, height issue. And then I look at it as a quality of their golf swing issue as well. So I like to have people try both, and then we determine which is best fit for them. Not only this orange whip that, that's, that's, that's kind of the bell cow of your um, uh, product offering, you've got some other stuff that um, we saw, oh gosh, what is probably a month or two ago when we were together in St. Louis. Talk a little bit about some of the other things that you offer um, uh, here with Orange Whip. An orange whip yep. golf, I guess. So we do we do have a junior version, same concept, but just lighter for kids, smaller grip. We also have what do we call the compact. The compact is even shorter than a junior, but it has the adult weights and the adult grip. Now we made the compact very short, like even shorter than your wedge, probably, for indoor use, office use, cold weather use, because we had a lot of passionate people who love the orange whip, but we had calls stating, hey, I hit my the chandelier in the house or I broke a lamp. Do you have another shorter version? So we, we compensated by making a shorter version. So we have those different versions of Orange Whips. And then we teamed up with Stan Utley. And we teamed up with Stan Utley because he's a, a tremendous short game, brilliant, talented guy. And I recall meeting him at, at a number of different teaching summits that I attended promoting the Orange Whip. And I would listen to his presentation. Everything he was saying about the short game was different than the way I was taught with the hands way ahead, drag the handle, and I would chunk and blade it like it was my job. So I started asking him <laughs> about his philosophy, and he uh, he goes, well, Jimmy, I've watched you do the orange rip presentation. Everything you talk about the full swing, you should be doing in your short game, but apparently you don't. So let's let's get together and let's figure this out. And after one session together in Arizona, he goes, hey, we could take this – a shorter version of this orange whip put a wedge head on it and it would accomplish everything you're trying to do and everything I'm trying to do. So that was a great moment for me because it allowed me to, to, to even take the, the concept of the orange whip philosophy into the short game with Stan's help. And then I, I've, I've previously developed a putter that we still have that's right and left handed. And it actually has a, it's kind of a unique design where it has a radius on its face. So it's almost like bulging roll from the old blot or excuse me, persimmon woods. And I did that because I wanted center contact and all the energy to be in the center as the main objective. And so Stan's helped us with the short game side of it tremendously. And that's where I'm proud because I wanted to be able to help every aspect of the game. And I think we've got products out there for that. Man, you're an inventor. You are just a golf nerd. You took golf nerd to a different level, didn't you? (laughs) You very much. And actually, if you don't mind, I'd like to interject one thing about that real briefly. When I developed the orange whip and when it started working and when I started having people succeed with it, I could teach them to swing. But then sometimes if you take a long golf club and a little golf ball and they make that nice swing, but they thin it or they don't quite catch it perfectly, they're always frustrated. It's like, oh, what did I do wrong? I go, well, well, nothing. You really made a nice golf swing there. But we've got to work on getting properly set up and in, in, in a simple way that you'll catch the ball. But it's still difficult. So I had a concept way back when that I finally just introduced, and I call it Chappy Golf. And what it is is a 
It's only one club. It's right or left-handed, so you can use it either way if you're learning the game. And it's a bigger ball. It's about the size of a baseball, but it's a foam material, so much easier to hit. And it only goes one-third the distance, so I can go to any park, beach, a lot of backyards, and I can just hit this and work on my swing in a fun, more comfortable atmosphere, safer even. And so my inventor side went to that as well. I wanted an easier way to get people to take the swing I'm helping them with to take it to the next level of impact in a ball. It's interesting stuff. Jim Hackenberg is our guest, founder of Orange Whip and Orange Whip Training. The best way to look at your products and what you offer, Jim, where should uh, folks go? OrangeWhipGolf.com. Check out there. We have a lot of videos and information there and just some of the new things we're doing. Like we're customizing Orange Whips now where we'll keep the orange ball because that's our name. But we can do different colored uh, shaft materials in different areas, different colored grip. So you can make it like your favorite team or your favorite colors or have it match your golf cart. We're, and even for events, we're doing a big thing with PGA Hope, we're making a bunch of orange whips for PGA Hope. And we're going to have their their uh, badge on it as well as the, you know, the flag. So we've got, a, we've got some neat things going. So check out orangewhipgolf.com or also go to YouTube and check out Orange Whip Golf. And you'll see there's hundreds of videos there if you want to get more information. We're huge supporters of uh, PGA Hope, PGA Reach, and all that. And it's great to know that you're um, involved with them as well, Jim. And we really appreciate you coming on today. Thank you, Jay. This has been a blast and dang good to meet you. So, yeah, I appreciate it. I, lo- I love to talk about it. And I could talk all day. So thank you for the opportunity. You bet. That is Jim Hackenberg, founder of Orange Whip and Orange Whip Training. This is Golf with Jay Delsing. Coming to you from the Car Shield Studios and as always presented by Darty Business Solutions. That was the front nine on Golf with Jay Delsing, presented by the Ascension Charity Classic. We're halfway home, and next, we'll make the turn. If you're in the market for a newer used vehicle, any maker model, then you need to visit the Dean Team Volkswagen of Kirkwood. They are the official vehicle provider of the Golf with Jay Delsing show. My daughter and I both drive vehicles supplied by Colin and the Dean Team Volkswagen of Kirkwood. And it's because we know we can trust them. They made the car buying experience painless and easy. And their customer service is second to none. Every single step of the car buying experience was taken care of for us. You can reach Colin at 314 966-0303 and he will answer all of your questions and put your mind at ease. The Dean Team Volkswagen of Kirkwood has new or pre-owned vehicles to be purchased or leased, whichever you prefer. Once you visit the Dean Team Volkswagen on Manchester in Kirkwood, you'll be a customer for life because they will treat you like family. The Dean Team Volkswagen of Kirkwood, the official vehicle provider of the Golf with Jay Delsing Show. This is Chris Nagel. And you're listening to Golf with Jay Delsing. So you've been hearing me talk about one of our community's greatest contributors and most philanthropically inclined companies. Yes, of course, I'm talking about Marcone. They're the largest distributor of General Electric appliance parts in North America. Did you know that Marcone is also the largest and most trusted supplier of commercial and residential appliance parts, HVAC, plumbing, commercial kitchens, and pools and spas, all of that's in North America as well. That's right, Marcone does all that. Marcone is committed to supporting our first responders, all the branches of service in our military, our police and firefighters, and many more. From the viewing deck at the Ascension Charity Classic, founded in honor of our military heroes, to their commitment to Reese Across America program, Marcone is here for you and your family, as well as your community. That's Marcone. The official sponsor of the Golf with Jay Delsing Show. Hi, this is Adam Best from Family Golf and Learning Center. At FGLC here in Kirkwood, we feature a double-decker driving range, two large grass tees with Tahoma Bermuda grass. You want to work on your short game? We have a short game area, too, which features a 20,000-square-foot green, three bunkers, and zoysia surrounds. Also at Family Golf and Learning Center, don't forget about our nine-hole par-3 course, the indoor trackman simulators, and our performance center. If you're looking for the best golf instruction, regardless of skill, we can help. Find out more at FamilyGolfOnline.com. That's FamilyGolfOnline.com. Family Golf and Learning Center. We make St. Louis better at golf. 
This is Jay Delsing. My show, Golf with Jay Delsing, can be heard every Sunday morning from 8 to 10 right here on 101 ESPN. And as always, it's brought to you by Darty Business Solutions. Tune in for the latest from the PGA Tour, the LPGA Tour, our local golf scene, and much, much more. That's Golf with Jay Delsing featuring the biggest names in golf every Sunday morning from 8 to 10 on 101 ESPN. This is Golf with Jay Delsing. The Back Nine is presented by Pro-Am Golf, located in Brentwood. See what Pro-Am Golf can do for you. Fun interview there with Jim Hackenberg of Orange Whip and Orange Whip Training. Welcome back. This is Golf with Jay Delsing, presented by Darty Business Solutions, and is always coming to you from the Car Shield Studios. Jay Delsing, Dan McLaughlin, on this Sunday morning here on 101 ESPN. We're going to help out some of the listeners too in terms of a promo code to get an Orange Whip. What do you have to do? Absolutely, just use the promo code J J A Y. It's not case sensitive. Capitals, smalls, whatever you're comfortable with, and you're going to get a nice discount off of the, any sort of purchase of an Orange Whip or uh, any of the products in the uh, Orange Whip training. So, D, let me tell you something. There's something so phenomenal about this Orange Whip, and people are going to go, yeah, look, if you think I'm, I'm, I'm trying to sell you an Orange Whip so I can make a couple bucks off it, email me and I'll send you whatever I get from when you when you buy one of these things. And I mean it because I am truly committed to trying to help people play better golf. And this device helps you load the club because of the, the way that the, he's got this thing counterbalanced and the, the, the orange head on the one end and the flexible, he said, like a fishing pole type shaft, it it loads for you and so it gets you it gets you kind of sequenced up and gets your body moving more like you want it to move to hit the kind of shots you want to hit i'm just try it well i see you do it all the time before we play all the time i I, all it's it's fantastic it is it's a great training tool it's inexpensive and it really makes a difference it can really help i think our listeners would love it in this segment of things that you use to prepare yourself to play golf so something like the arc yeah when you're putting yep the putting arc is fantastic i love the putting arc it's a slight so what the putting arc does guys is it keeps you your your the biggest thing, in my opinion, to putt well is minimize your face rotation. That means how much the toe swings open. It's not like a door. We want that putter staying so square on the way back. We want it opening just slightly. You watch every single guy that putts well on the PGA Tour, they are not rotating the face of that club much. That putting arc is a phenomenal tool for that. It also helps with your path. So many people go too far inside, D. We just want it to go slightly inside with a little bit of face rotation. And the beautiful thing about the arc, put the heel or the toe of your putter, whichever you prefer, on the arc and stroke it. You don't have to do anything else. It's right there for you. I want to remind everybody we're going to visit with Joey Vitale coming up, the Blues analyst. Should be fun to visit about Hockey players getting into golf or golfers that like hockey like you. I mean, I love all sports and I love hockey. I don't even know if Joe likes golf. I know it's going to be. Let's find out. I know it's going to be super fun. So, um, yeah, I I'm I'm looking forward to it. But but check out that or check out the orange whip. Also check out the putting arc. There's um um a, a couple other devices. Well, that that's you what I wanted to ask you about. Yeah. What what else comes to mind of things that you train with that the average golfer can use to try to be better? So this is sound crazy because it's not necessarily golf specific. But we keep talking about stretching and we keep talking about how important that is. And I've got this band that I use at home and I get on the floor and I help stretch my hamstrings with it and I help and I do a couple of upper body stretches with it as well because you know I want to get that full turn D I want to get back behind the ball with that full turn and I and I don't want to be swaying and so I need that upper body to be flexible so what I'll do is I'll lay on the floor and I'll 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 put one knee 
uh, one leg flat on the floor uh, or bend it, depending on how flexible you are, and then get the other leg and stretch it up and go slow. Don't bounce too much, but just get those, keep those hamstrings stretched. I've had bad backs before. I still have a bulky sort of back, but it's, and I'm, I'm working on it constantly because, man, the, if you got a sore back trying to play good golf, it's, it seems impossible. Sometimes I hear you when we're playing talk about grips. Yep. Is there a particular club, like a training tool, that'll put your hands together in the proper position? There is. There is. There is a, and and I'll come back with a. It is. It there is a a, a plastic preformed grip that if you go to Golf Galaxy, if you go almost anywhere, somewhere along the line, they'll have one of those, and that is. When if if I would have started with one of those, you know, when we were kids, it would have it would have saved me a lot of tears on the driving range one year because I started off with Hitting a, like a baseball grip, didn't you? Yeah, ten fingers like a baseball, <laughs> just like a, I, I mean, my my thumbs were underneath the shaft over there, and Danny, I, I could you think I can slice it now? I could hook it around a building back then, <laughs> and then I went I went through this change in grip, and it was extremely difficult for about two weeks, and then it clicked right back in but there's a couple different variations of the grip but this little thing that you'll see it it, they'll they'll, you can go to dick sporting goods you could go to pro-am golf here in st louis they'll have it i guarantee you adam will have one down at family golf and learning center because that's an adam thing and he wants to make you better at golf just like tom DeGrand. so you you will you can find those and, and put your hand on there and get a sense for what that looks like and if you a little confused just google it and get your hands on there and then get in front of a mirror and just try to replicate that. How about getting up against a wall? I've heard you talk about that and how that can benefit a golfer. I'm working right now with your daughter on this really super cool drill. So, so in, in order to get rid of sort of a lateral slide, especially on the forward end of the ball. So your daughter, Avery is going to be, she's a stud. She's a three time all state player. She, she, uh, anchored the state championship team now, and she's getting ready to go through a qualifier in uh, for the AJGA event. And she has a tendency to take on her downswing, she takes her left hip and moves a little towards the ball and then forward. And what happens to that little move in front is that it blocks out. Her, it doesn't allow her club to get down to impact area, area cleanly, and it gets affected, usually leaving it out to the right a little bit. And so what we did is we got her um, set up with her uh, rear end touching the wall. Okay, and now she's at setup. She's working on that setup. And as she goes back and makes her backswing, the right side of her, her, her rear stays on the wall and her left comes off. Then as she starts her downswing, it replaces itself. She starts turning. And I said for Avery, we're getting her to put the left side of her, her body on that wall immediately and turn that right hip as fast fast as possible and she's extremely proficient at that that's why she's so powerful but it has made a world of difference man she came out striping the ball this week and i see so many folks want speed but they don't understand that they have to turn correctly if they turn and go a little forward it's going to block them out and it's going to it'll actually make them probably hit it shorter. Emails at j at jdelsinggolf.com. We'll get to emails a little later in the show. And again, Joy Vitale is coming up. Can you think of any other types of uh, programs that are out there for people to use? Whether it's, uh, as you mentioned, using the grip tool, yeah. using the orange whip. Are, yeah. are there other things that you like? You mentioned the putting arc. Is there anything else that stands out? Danny, I, I would just go right back, and I harp on this all the time, and I'm sure people are going to go get a cup of coffee right now when I am say this, but use the putting clock. Yeah, it, it does so many good things. You start at two feet and then three feet and then four feet, and you only have four balls, so you need to make 12 putts in a row. You need to make four two-footers in a row and then go to make three four, three footers in a row, and they go around the hole, hence the clock. And then once you do that, you make four, four footers in a row, and then your drill's over. But what it does, Danny, is it puts pressure on you because as soon as you miss one of those, start over. Start you over. You can look. There's Dude, some I pressure think, in doing that. It is. Danny, last year, I think I spent 
almost an hour and 20 minutes it took me. I go three feet, four feet, five feet, and I got to that five, that last five-footer, and I missed it like two or three times. I was hot. Yeah. And But I'm like, I'm not, I'm not giving up, and I'm not going home until I do this thing. One of the great scenes in Tin Cup, and I, I think of you every <laughs> once in a while, is when he gets the, I hate even saying the word, so I'm not going to yeah, say it. You can say it. No, he's hitting it left, right, dribbling it. I can't say the word because it'll make me upset. I'm not doing it. <laughs> but he's got all the gimmicks oh, on the on the driving range. I, I thought, man, everybody, I don't care how good you've been, everybody's tried out something to help themselves. Oh, you know it. And I've got an old picture of Steve Pate, my buddy from college on the range at uh, San Antonio, at the TPC of San Antonio. And he looks exactly like that guy. He's got springs headed from him he's got <laughs> lines he's got bungee cords and all this stuff and we're like good luck Fader. it looks like it, you know it looks like you're in prison over there but no i mean we're crazy we're yeah. crazy if you told me you know to, to to putt and put my left hand in my pocket and jingle change and told me i'd make all my 10 fo- putts from 10 feet on in you do it i'm done yeah i'll be whistling do you tell me give it just tell me what it looks like i'll do it i'll try it golf with jay delsing rolls on coming up joey vitale This is a fun show. This is Golf with Jay Delsing. This is Golf with Jay Delsing. The Back Nine is presented by Pro-Am Golf, located in Brentwood. See what Pro-Am Golf can do for you. WXOS, WXOS HD1 East St. Louis, 101 ESPN is driven by Auto Centers Nissan, home of the lifetime warranty and 30-day return. Hey, Jay Delsing here, and I know I speak for all of we golfers. We're always looking to try to improve our game. For me, that means I go to one place, and that one place is... Pro-Am Golf in Brentwood. Tom DeGrand opened his family business in 1975 with a goal of providing St. Louis with the finest in golf equipment, instruction, and technology. Whether you need a new rangefinder, your first set of clubs, or anything else you can think of, Pro-Am Golf has just what you're looking for. If you're a scratch handicap or you carry a 20 handicap, come visit Pro-Am Golf and inquire about a lesson from Tom DeGram. He's been fixing golf swings and making St. Louis better at golf for over 40 years. Go get your gear, lessons, or anything golf-related where I go. And that's Pro-Am Golf in Brentwood. You can also visit them online at Pro-Am Golf USA. That's ProAmGolfUSA.com. It's Pro-Am Golf. Proud sponsor of the Golf with Jay Delson Show. Hey, St. Louis. Eddie McVeigh here from Maggie O'Brien's. When you head downtown for a concert or cards or blues game, and now for the St. Louis City soccer game, please come see us at Maggie O'Brien's before and after your event. Take our shuttle to and from or stay in-house and watch your favorite team on our multiple high-def TVs. We look forward to seeing you soon at one of our two locations in Sunset Hills on South Lindbergh or downtown at the corner of Market and 20th Street. Union Station is next to us. Powers Insurance and Risk Management is a family-owned local business that's been helping our community for over 200 years. In the always confusing world of insurance, Powers Insurance provides clarity, exceptional service, and the latest in cutting-edge products to deliver the highest quality in property and casualty coverage, as well as strategic planning consultation services. Powers Insurance and Risk Management will partner with you. That's right, they'll partner with you to customize the right coverage for you and your family. Tim Davis, Chief Operating Officer, will personally sit down and talk you through the ins and the outs of your policies. They are experts at helping you control your workplace expenses, helping to guarantee the safety that you and your employees need. You can visit them at powersinsurance.com. That's powersinsurance.com for all your insurance needs. For the best in Italian cuisine in St. Louis, look no further than Paul Mano's, located in Chesterfield. It's traditional Italian cooking, and their best ingredient, it's their tradition. It's cooking like Paul's grandmother used to make and like his mother still prepares today. There are no corners cut at Paul Mano's, from greeting you at the door to the pasta you'll share with your family. Paul Mano's is committed to bringing you their very best anytime you share a meal at their place. It's Paul Mano's located in Chesterfield. Do you remember the golden rule? I'm sure you do, but just in case it goes like this. Treat people the way that you'd like to be treated. At People's National Bank, that one statement is the cornerstone of what this bank is all about. Locally owned with 23 locations in Southern Illinois and the metropolitan St. Louis area, 
People's National Bank parlays a robust menu of commercial or personal banking services you could possibly need with a friendly yet hardworking Midwestern attitude. Maybe you just want to do business with a bank whose entire team lives in the same neighborhoods as we do. If you're like me and doing business with someone you trust is important to you, then People's National Bank is the bank for you. Jason Rantham, local president, is here for you to call and he'll answer any questions you may have. His personal cell is 314-974-2243. You can also find us online at peoplesnationalbank.com. People's National Bank is here for all of your banking needs. Hello, friends. This is Jim Nance, and you are listening to Golf with my friend, Jay Delson. Well, Jay Delsing rolls on on a Sunday morning, and we get a chance to visit with St. Louis Blues radio analyst. You see him on the video board down at the Blues games. You may see him on television as well, and that's Joey Vitale. That's Jay Delsing. I'm Dan McLaughlin, and Joey, thanks for coming on. We appreciate it. Hey, of course, boys. You no, know, I'm happy to happy to talk to you guys as always. Did you think you'd be on a golf show when you played your career in the NHL? No, it's funny. I never, I never got into golf. It was, it's the one sport that every hockey player plays. And the very last time I was golfing was I went out with Tony Sansone and Tony, he said, Hey, come on out. I'm like, Hey, Tony, I don't really play very much. He's like, come on out. It's a charity thing. I step up to the tee box. And before I make my first swing, he yells in front of everyone. He said, I've never seen a hockey player that's bad at golf. And I shanked one into the woods. And it, was just downhill. <laughs> it was just downhill from there i don't know if it's my hips i don't know what's going on maybe jay can give me a lesson or two but it's it's a sport i have yet to figure out to playing with tony sansone too man that's tall cotton there's a lot of pressure just stepping on the tee when you're when you're playing with tony that, that's just it i mean you better be you better be prepared to be just humiliated not only you know from a <laughs> golf standpoint but just from a from a personal standpoint all day long i mean he just he'd bury you any chance he got and and you got to make sure you leave your emotions and your, uh, of course, everything in check before you even step on the uh, the greens and the, the tee box with Tony because he'll let you have it, no doubt. Joey Vitale is our guest. And, and, Joey, we get different walks of life on this show, and we're talking to a guy that played hockey. But I want to get into your St. Louis roots and what's happening with youth hockey here in St. Louis. I know your kids play, and I love that your daughter plays. It's pretty amazing what's happening right now with youth hockey here in St. Louis. It's amazing, Dan. I mean, I was just out at Centene, you know, the other weekend ago for the for the Blue Note Cup. And if anyone who's got a kid playing hockey or not, I, I still think that first weekend of March, go out to Centene, look for the look for all the stuff on social media and, and the blues certainly put stuff out. But the Blue Note Cup has picked up so much momentum in the last couple of years. It was a jammed house. You couldn't even walk around Centene Community Ice Center. Every rink is filled. My daughter played on the Plager rink. There were four rows deep of fans. Um, Kirkwood, Chesterfield, the USA building doesn't quite fill up completely, but that's that's a big building. But I'm telling you, it is just amazing to see not only all the kids playing, but what's really special to me is that when kids are on the ice playing and participating and, and obviously chasing for that that cup, there are just the friends and the family and the relatives and the neighbors and the former teammates and the former coaches. It's just, it's a wonderful thing because everyone is out there supporting either an organization or, or someone they know. And what I love most about it is that hockey has grown so much, like you said, but it's so spread out. I mean, you got teams out in St. Charles, you got teams at Merrimack down South, you go way up, way up North, of course, to the Maryville areas and the Centines, there's Creek Corps, there's Afton, they're spread out everywhere. But what's cool about this weekend is it is the one weekend where everyone really does officially come together. You see all kinds of organizations. You see people you haven't seen in years. And everyone's there for the sole purpose of just supporting young hockey players in St. Louis. It really has taken off. I mean, the two biggest reasons, of course, being, you know, the Blues win the Cup in 19. And then, of course, that huge draft class with the five first overalls um, back about seven, eight years ago now as well. Really has caught fire here in St. Louis. And I'm really grateful for it, too, because it's such a wonderful sport. It teaches such great lessons. 
and you just see it grow and grow more and more every year, which is just really fun to see. It was a proud weekend for the Vi- uh, in the Vitali house, too. Somebody uh, that's pretty near and dear to your heart scored a winning goal, didn't she? Yeah, she did. Well, you know, so it started with my son, Harper. He had the first game. He plays for, you know, Jamal, and he plays for Matt Lashoff and myself, and it's a really fun little AAA Blues team. So they got their win, and they were excited. You know, and then, I, and then I, I literally went right from the USA rink over across the hallway there to play your rink. I caught it just in time for the start of the game where I help coach, you know, her Kirkwood A1 team. She's a peewee with Nick Cernko. And, you know, it's just – it was a special game for me. And, you know, every parent can relate to the the day that you realize that this may be your kid's last game in this particular sport. My daughter, Summer, she loves volleyball. And I've got her – I convinced her in the last couple of years to stick with hockey a couple more years. And she's a great little athlete, a wonderful skater. And, you know, she's at an age where she's hit puberty before the boys, so she's starting to grow a little bit taller than the boys. So she's hung in very well this year, and she loved it. And, you know, she's missed a lot this year because she plays, you know, very high-level volleyball. But she was able to make last weekend and, of course, the weekend before. And in that championship game, I'm out there coaching her. And it was just win or loss. I didn't care. I'm watching my daughter, you know, I remember the first time she laid – those skates on the ice when she's about six years old and now she's 13 and you know the thought of this may be in her last year and maybe her last game you know I was just fighting back tears the whole game of course and just so proud of her and proud of that whole team but you're right it was a, a tight game we played the Falcons uh, a team that we weren't back and forth with all all year long and it was 0-0 all the way to the to the final couple minutes and we called the timeout and uh, like what they say about a blind squirrel finding a nut every now and then a coach can be right. I brought the group in. I said, guys, this goalie is good. It's going to be a shot from the point. We need our forwards going to the net. It's going to be a rebound or it's going to be a funky tip. I've seen these games before. It's not going to be pretty. So hang in there, get to the front of the net, D, keep your shots low, get them through. And sure enough, with I think a minute 11, she won the faceoff, got to the net. We had a great shot from the point. She got the backhand rebound. And, of course, everyone at Plager just blew up and exploded the energy and the, the noise. And she was so pumped. And and she got her first Blue Note Cup. She lost three previous years in the championship. And, like I said, if, if that was her final game, uh, it was just she just went out with a bang. So a proud dad moment, but just a proud moment. Uh, from a youth hockey coach across the board, seeing Chesterfield battle so hard, and, of course, everyone from the Kirkwood Stars as well. Joey, talk a little bit about um, – I'm much older than you are, but I know a lot of the guys who were who were parents and related to that great draft class that came out of St. Louis. We had five first-rounders, I think, six, eight years ago or so. Talk a little bit about the significance of that and, and growing the game of hockey and, and, and the community of hockey. Well, yeah, you know, Jay, you bring up a great point. And I think that, you know, the Blues winning the Cup definitely helped youth hockey a lot here in St. Louis. But I actually think it was that draft class and everything those coaches did leading up to the. I think that that's what's really propelled St. Louis. And it all started with players who played in St. Louis, liked St. Louis, and decided to stay in St. Louis. And then, of course, as their kids got older, they became their coaches. You know, and I know it's, you know, crazy for some people to think, why would why would former professional hockey players from, you know, Ottawa and Toronto and, you know, Winnipeg, why would they stay in St. Louis? And I think Wayne Gretzky actually put it the best when I asked him. He said, St. Louis is a big enough sports town where you have the sports and you have the energy where it's very lively, but it's small enough and quaint enough where you can go to Schnooks and no one bothers you. I mean, that, that to me is a perfect balance uh, by the great one. And I think that that every player feels the same way. You have the luxury of sports. You have the luxury of a great place to raise a family, but you also, you know, people mind, let you mind your own business and they kind of let you do your thing, which is really, really attractive for players to, to retire here. So Keith Kachuk, you know, he sticks around here. You know, Al McGinnis stays around here. Barrett Jackman sticks around here. Here's Jamal Mayers now with this next wave. And what happens is you end up taking that kind of expertise and all that knowledge and you kind of just filter it to the next generation. And that's what, that's what happened with that draft class. You know, Keith Kachuk, for example, you know, being around playing for the blues, you know, you, you start to pass that knowledge on number one, but I think the biggest thing that we saw with that draft class and ideally what we're seeing with the, the next group coming is that they're around the game a lot more and they're watching a ton of hockey. Like those Kachuk boys, they were always at the rink. They were always watching practice. They were always watching games. And that's why I think from an emotionally intelligent standpoint, you're, they're, you're, you're probably talking about the two most emotionally intelligent players in the league with, with Brady and, and of course his brother, uh, because you look at what the game needs, maybe needs a hit, maybe needs a fight, you know, 
the temperature of the game, the knowledge of the game, you know, understanding the actual game itself. You can only learn that by watching the game. And I think for, for Walt's sons, you know, I think that they were around the game a lot. And that's how you really increase that hockey IQ. But, you know, so it just started there. It built a ton of momentum. And then, as we all know, and we saw that draft class, and not only the draft class, but the success of the draft class uh, certainly uh, was well recognized. And, of course, everyone in St. Louis uh, absolutely is so proud of those boys. And you're kind of looking for that next class of kids that kind of come up and, and kind of almost mimic that. Now, will it be ever the same as that? No. I mean, five kids drafted in the first round from Toronto, that's that's a lot. Like, that. that's unheard of. So the fact that it came from St. Louis, I mean, we're talking about one in a million. It'll never be that again. But I think that there's a, certainly another wave of kids, uh, like a draft class like we saw, that is certainly coming here from St. Louis. Joey Vitale is our guest, does an outstanding job as an analyst for Blues Hockey. As a kid, what attracted you to play hockey? When you mention all these other kids, how about for you? And not golf, man. Hockey. Yes. Well, I've realized that, uh, you know, my dad poured concrete for a living. And he's an old school Italian. He's old school, Jay. So you got you got to give him a break here on this one. But all he did was pour concrete, come home, eat pasta, wake up, <laughs> go to church on Sunday, rinse and repeat. That was it. If he wasn't at church and he wasn't at the office, he was probably sleeping in his bed. That's that's how my dad. And we would always drive past golf courses. And I, no joke, he'd always say, man, look at all those lazy guys playing golf. He hated <laughs> golfers. He hated golfers because he figured in his in his mind, if you weren't home with your family, you should be pouring concrete and vice versa. That's it. And then on church on Sunday, and those are the only three places any man should ever be. So that kind of goes to show you the old school, of course, that was in my dad. But, you know, he poured concrete. Uh, one thing we grew a hate for was was golf, as, as we all know. And uh, one day, you know, one day, Dan, my brother, Sam, who was the oldest, came home and said, I gotta, hold on, Joey. I, I got to tell you, you're the perfect guest for a golf this show. I hate great, golf. This, this is, is great. This is awesome. But go yeah. right ahead. I'm just being real. I'm just being yeah. real. You guys asked me to come on. I'm just being who I am. You can edit and chop it however you want. I don't, I don't really care. Oh, no. This is it, baby. <laughs> but, you know, it, it kind of could set us up for a, a pretty cool show down the road if you ever give me a lesson, Jay. Maybe, you know, I, I, I'm like the I'm like the 10 at the bar that no one can get. You're like, okay, uh, there's something about her. I'm going to figure out if I can get it. I'm the one that no one can reel in. I'm the challenge for the golf standpoint <laughs> where if you can – if you can give me a lesson and get me engaged, you can be known as that. That'll go down in your resume as, "Hey, I got Joe Vitale to like golf." That would be kind of a cool. Love thing. it. So, how did you get attracted to the game of uh, the game of hockey? You know, my brothers they came home. They wanted to play. I remember my dad went to Johnny Max, Danny Mac. You remember Johnny Max? And Absolutely. Jay, oh, oh, for sure. Of, of course, off Watson Road there in Crestwood. Uh, that's where all the sport, all the sporting goods were were sold back. You know, thirty years ago when I was a kid. And they went to Johnny Max. They loaded up on equipment. I just remember seeing the equipment thinking, man, these guys look like knights and warriors. I want this equipment. So then I asked my mom and dad, and and I just followed my brothers, my older brother Sam, my older brother Charlie. Whatever they did, I did. And, of course, they started. I picked it up. And I think, you know, a blessing in disguise was my brother Charlie was a year older than me. My brother Sam was three years but they couldn't, they couldn't have us on three different teams because I was one of six kids. And, again, my dad's pouring concrete. My mom couldn't do it all. So they're like, hey, Joe, you can play, but since you're the closest to Charlie, we're going to have you play up a year if that's okay. And I said, absolutely, that's fine. I didn't really care. So I played my whole youth hockey playing up a year. And then I think what, what really got me excited, of course, about hockey as I continued to play was I saw a kid named Cam Jansen at Fenton Ice Forum when I was about 13 years old. And I saw this little kid from Eureka, and he was just skating around, hitting. At, we were mites. We weren't even allowed to hit. And this kid was just flying around with his head down, hitting everything in sight. And I just remember thinking, gosh, I want to be just like that guy. And, of course, Cam, the rest, the rest is history with him. He certainly set a paved way for the next wave or the first wave, in my opinion, of St. Louis players coming out of St. Louis played alongside Cam, played alongside my brother Charlie. And, you know, it just – I don't know what to tell you, Dan. It, it wasn't like I wanted to play college. I never set my sights on playing professional hockey. I just loved the game, and we just kept showing up every day, and we just kept playing with each other and playing for each other. And it just kind of kept happening over and over and over. And looking back, there wasn't like we had this goal and we achieved it. It was just kind of this unfolding that we just enjoyed what we did, and we did it every day. We did it to the highest of the ability that we had at the time, and it just kind of unfolded in a really, really cool way, and that's that's kind of how it went. 
Joe, you know what's amazing, and you use this, I'm sure, with your kids uh, as a lesson, is you stay in the present, you do the best you can, and you keep working at something that you really enjoy, and look what happens. I mean, some of us had goals that, hey, I, I wanted to play on the PGA Tour, I wanted to play in the NHL, whatever, whatever. But others, like your story, is just fantastic because things like that can happen to anyone if they work hard enough. You know, Jay, you're, you're exactly right. And Tom Fitzgerald, since you bring that up, he's now the GM of the New Jersey Devils. He's certainly going to be busy over the next couple of days. But he was our assistant GM in Pittsburgh. Now, this is my my first camp with the Pittsburgh Penguins. I was just drafted a couple of years prior. And I was in the locker room. And I'm my first day in the locker room, we just finished our first day of practice. And it was with all the draft class and all the young prospects and you know, Tom Fitzgerald's in the room, small talking with some coaches, and I'm in the room, and no one's talking to me. Like, not one reporter. We have first-rounders. Sidney Crosby's in the room. Kevin Veyu, All these kind of kids that everyone's really excited about. And I'm kind of in the corner just by myself. And I didn't even know Tom saw me. Anyway, at the end of camp, four days later, I'm in Tom's office, and we're talking. And he said, Joe, I noticed you day one at the end of camp, just kind of sitting by yourself looking around and seeing all the reporters and all the attention of all the crazy draft picks and high profile athletes we have coming up. And I said, yeah, Tom, I did. And he said, what I want you to understand is that does not matter. That is just noise. He said, I want you to do one thing. And I remember, I never forget looking him in the eye across the desk when he was just an assistant GM and his advice I, I've stuck with my entire life. And it goes to your point, Jay, he said, I want you to focus on one thing and one thing only. And if you do this, you're going to get to the NHL. I don't care about anyone else. And I said, what's that, Tom? He goes, I want you to worry about today. And then when you wake up tomorrow, I want you to worry about today. And I want you to rinse and repeat that. And I want you to do that every single day. Don't worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about next week. Don't worry about making your NHL debut in two years. That is just noise. And it's in the future. And it's a waste of time and energy. He goes, if you wake up every single day, and you just focus your time and attention on everything that's in your control, your rest, your recovery, your conditioning, your practice habits, your attitude. If you do that, I promise you one day you're going to be in the NHL. And I'll never forget him saying that. And I remember thinking about that when I was in the minors and just seeing all these other kids get called up that I felt like I was better at. But just, you know what? You're right. You wake up every day. You do your job. You do it to the very best of your ability. And you don't look to the left, you don't look to the right, you don't look behind you, you don't even look in the 40. You just kind of sometimes just got to put your head down and just go to work. And fortunately for me, timing wise, I was very lucky as well, but it worked out very well. But I'll never forget that advice from Tom Fitzgerald, who, of course, now is doing some incredible things with the New Jersey Devils, and they're on the cusp of a really cool era of hockey as well. You know, Joey, one of the things I wanted to talk about is I think we're in a really interesting, maybe strange time in in sports, especially if you want, since we're a golf show, we're going to talk about some of the weird things that are going on with the world of golf. And there's, it's an unusual time, at least in my opinion, in the, in the NHL, I'm a massive hockey fan, but just a fan, but I'm watching all these coaches get fired. I'm watching these, these guys, older guys have a hard time obviously communicating and getting through. And I'm also looking at feeling like, Joey, there's an era of low accountability for athletes. I know these golfers, they're taking all this money going to live and now they want, they want everything. They want world golf rankings. They want to play in all, every tournament. They want to sue the PGA tour. They want, and it's like, what's happened to people? It's like you made your decision, stay in your league, stay in your lane. I'm watching these young players, extremely talented, but take nights off, um, uh, not listen to their coaches, not really kind of buy into systems, Joey. It's for me, I, again, I know I'm old, I'm old school. I just don't understand. You know, there, there's a couple couple foods for thought for you here, Jay. And I, I'm going to give you the hockey perspective, and I'm sure that you can connect the dots with maybe how it relates to golf because I can't do that. But what, what I'll say is a couple things. Number one is the way contracts are given out is, is something you, you can't overlook. You know, Robert Thomas and Jordan Cairo were given eight-year contracts last year. Now, back in the day, you know, you say like, back in the day, I feel like I'm an old man, but, you know, 20 years ago, you performed, you earned the recognition, and then you got paid based off of your performance. Now it's almost flip-flopped. Now they see a young prospect who they think is going to be very good, 
and they throw him they throw him an eight year contract because at the end of the day, if he surpasses what they project him to be, you're looking at in three and four years, it's going to be quite a deal. Let's look at Robert Thomas's contract. He was given an eight by eight year deal last year, the year before. Now that's a lot of money for a very very young kid who has he has he really proved to earn eight million dollars a year when he signed that contract? The answer is no. But what GMs and of course the league is doing na- nationwide and, and countrywide now is they're looking at it like this kid's going to be really good. Let's lock him up. We may overpay him for a couple of years, but if he continues to go with this trajectory within three or four years, we're going to say, what a deal. And you know what? For Robert Thomas, I think he actually is outplaying his $8 million contract right now. And this is extremely early in his eight year deal. Can you imagine if he continues to perform at the level and, and he continues to grow from where he was last year to this year. You're talking about a player that could be make, could be getting 120 points in this league in three or four years who's making $8 million. I mean, that's comparable to a player who should be probably making 11 to $12 million. So that's the way the contracts are structured. Now, why do I bring that up? I bring that up because it is something now where you look at young players and it's less about earning that money and more about just projecting that money. And I think that with that comes this, this idea that – young players are anointed into the game now. It's less about earning it, and it's more about they're just super talented, and they got this amazing amount of quote-unquote potential, so they're going to be given this money, they're going to be given the ice time, they're going to be given the power play, and so much of it is given now. We're back in the day, you know, Jay and Dan, I mean, I had a grind in the minors for four straight years, you know, eating pizza on buses and getting home after a 12-hour bus trip at four in the morning, waking up to do it all over again. I mean, that that American Hockey League minor league grind, it doesn't exist as much now in the game as it used to. And I think back in the day when players were grinding and having to really earn it, when they got to the NHL, they they made it known that they don't want to ever go back down there and they're willing to do anything. They're extremely obedient to the coaches because they don't ever want to go back down to the minors. But now it's just different where this anointing of you know this potential athlete now players, I think, just get a little bit um, – maybe their heads get a little bit big and, and you lose a little bit of it. And, and, I, and I feel for the coaches too, and this is a whole other subject, but it kind of goes to your point. The game of hockey has changed so much from where it was 20 years ago. There's this whole idea that young players are, are super skilled, but a lot of players lack what's called hockey IQ, the knowledge of the game, right? And – you look at the way the last 15 years of developing youth hockey players has gone. Hockey players now, they're being told what to do the moment they step on the ice from the age of 6 to 8 to 10 to 12 to 14. Every drill, every cone, every turn, every shot, right? Now, back in the day, I was talking to Braden Shen about this. He grew up in a neighborhood where there was no organized coaching. They grew up in a neighbor, neighborhood up in Canada where there were seven ponds around their neighborhood. And every day they'd come home from school and they wouldn't come back home until it was completely dark. And they would just play pickup hockey with all the neighborhood, a neighborhood that sent nine kids to the WHL draft. And of course, three of them made it to the National Hockey League. Now, what does that tell you? It's telling you that when you're playing disorganized, chaotic style of hockey like that, one thing that is improving is your hockey IQ. You're learning the game because you're having to learn from your mistakes. But now the way youth hockey has certainly turned is two things. Coaches are making players do certain things all the time. So now in a game, when you have to make decisions, they don't really know what to do. So that's been hard for coaches to have to coach these young players who lack who lack a hockey IQ. So that that's a whole nother thing when you talk about the coaches and how they're struggling with these players. So much of it is this this idea that, you know, you're, you're dealing with young athletes who just don't know how to make decisions. And the last thing I'll add to that, and maybe this is like this in golf, hockey's gotten really expensive, like really expensive. And this is youth sports, I think, across the board. Now, what's the biggest problem with that? Well, according to Braden Shen, with his neighborhood he grew up with, no one could afford hockey. But they all got a chance to play hockey because there were outdoor rinks and all you needed was a stick and some skates. But nowadays, if you want to play hockey, you better have all the right equipment. You better have five, ten, twelve thousand dollars if you want to play at the highest level. You better do it year round. You better be able to afford camps. You better be able to afford trainers when your kids hit puberty. I mean, it's this whole thing where it's so expensive. Now, what's the problem with that? The problem is when it's this expensive. You end up losing the athlete somewhere along the way that can't afford it. You know, so 
20 years ago, you had pure athletes who were hockey players. But now, coming into the league, I, I, I think we've, we've lost a lot of those pure athletes because they simply could not afford the sport at a very young age. So that's also what's been changing, I think, in the sport of hockey, which all kind of ties back into why coaches have had such a hard time getting through to these young players and why you're seeing so many of them lose their jobs. Joey, our final question would be this. How many times in the locker room are hockey players talking about golf? They may be in pools. They may be talking about the Masters and who they got, drawing it out of a hat. They may talk about their weekend game coming up. How much is, is golf talked about inside those rooms? You know what? It's talked about more than any other sport. I, and that's what drove me even more crazy, Dan, when I was playing, when I was brought. Nothing drives me more crazy, Jay. I mean, you, you see guys at the gym do this, but you come in the locker room and the guys are they're doing that, like, pretend swing with their hips and their <laughs> arms are flinging forward. I'm like, can you stop that stupid swinging thing, whatever you're doing? And, and uh, but they're, they're doing it this time of the year. And uh, certainly, I, I will say, and I, and I know I've dog golf a little bit, and I will give it a little bit of love. As a player and as a broadcaster and everything, when I start seeing commercials about the Masters, that I do get it's excited It's on, isn't it? it? Yeah. That's so yeah. cool. Joey, I got to tell you a quick story. So I would play golf with Bernie Federko, Kelly Chase, guys my more my age, my generation, and we play a lot of golf. And I said, guys, I want to go. You got to take me to the rink. I haven't skated in probably 25 years, but I want to go to the rink. Long story short, I, I put my... I didn't know how to put my equipment on because I never had equipment. I was wearing figure skates because I had three <laughs> older sisters and I wore hand-me-downs. So I got hockey skates for the first time. Didn't know how to put I, – I put everything on except my pants. And Bernie said, you got to take everything off because you got to put your pants on first because they won't fit in over your skates. <laughs> I stood up in the locker room down at the, down at the um, – Enterprise and hit my head on the TV because there's not that many tall hockey players. And Bernie told me my handicap was a 60. My my <laughs> my hockey handicap was a 60 because I can only stop with my left foot on the outside. I don't know. I had so much fun, Joy, but that sport is way super hard, man. I mean, and see, that's I look at the sport of golf, and you know, the one thing I'll say, Jay about hockey that golf and you know if golf adapts this maybe i'll take it on and hockey whenever i made a mistake i at least knew i can just like go full speed and run someone into the boards and take out my aggression <laughs> until golf has an element of that i just don't know if i'm ever going to be able to figure out a way to to release some of my adrenaline and release some of my negative emotion brett hall who is a great guy and and i played oh my gosh hundreds of rounds with holly Decided to play, and we had a, a Nike tur tournament come in, which is the equivalent of the Corn Ferry, coming to St. Louis, and they gave Brett an exemption to play in. The first day didn't go well, and the second day, I think he wound up sweating through like three shirts a day, Joey. He also <laughs> said, I can't walk down the fairways with someone I'm trying to beat. You know, there's just that whole different mentality where he's like, yes. I want to hit this guy with my five iron. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to talk to him about how his, you know, sister and family are doing or something like that. Exactly. It's like you're going right next against your competitor and you can't punch him in the head. Uh, and then the other thing is, the other thing is you got to, you got to keep everything in check and it's just you. I mean, I respect golfers in the sense that it's, it's you and you when you do good, Give yourself credit. When you do bad, you don't have anyone to blame. Listen, Jay, I love hockey because I can still blame five other guys on the ice that they didn't do their job, and that's why I couldn't <laughs> do my job. Coach says, Joe, what the hell happened? I say, listen, Coach, I have my guy. I think you need to talk to my defensive partner who did not have his guy. And and then hockey players, we deflect responsibility. And, you know, I've obviously – Learned to deflect responsibility as a husband hasn't worked out that well, but <laughs> actually deflect responsibility. And as a golfer, you just can't do that. We got a caddy. You got a caddy. Well, I guess you got a caddy. That's true. Joe, this is how the caddy talk goes. We were going along beautifully. We were making birdies. All of a sudden, he double bogeyed. <laughs> oh, I love he that. double I love bogey. That. Can you believe he'd hit that ball in the water? And I look at him like my caddy's telling that story about me, and I'm like. Get over here. I'm going to hit you with I'm now I'm going to hit you with my five iron. Hey, I Joey, you, you're the best, man. It's so great, Joey. We, we took a lot of your time, and we know you're busy, and you got family obligations here in St. Louis. Thanks so much for doing this. We really appreciate it. Hey, I, I appreciate you guys. I love love what you're doing with the sports world here in St. Louis. Keep, keep up the great work, and it's always great catching up with you guys as well, and we'll look forward to the next one. That's Joey Vitale, and this is Golf with Jay Delson.
Redbird Heating and Cooling sponsors the Veterans Vocational Apprentice Program. Jed Dickinson, a retired Navy man, will teach, mentor, and sign off on educational and mechanical work hours to help you get fully licensed while you work and get paid by the company. What a great way to launch your career as a fully licensed HVAC specialist. Call Redbird Heating and Cooling today at 314-320-9507. That's Redbird Heating and Cooling. You're listening to Golf with Jay Delsing. To connect with Jay, log on to jdelsinggolf.com. You'll see the latest in equipment, find the latest innovations in golf, and get tips from a PGA professional. That's jdelsinggolf.com. This is Jay Delsing. My show, Golf with Jay Delsing, can be heard every Sunday morning from 8 to 10 right here on 101 ESPN. And as always, it's brought to you by Darty Business Solutions. Tune in for the latest from the PGA Tour, the LPGA Tour, our local golf scene, and much, much more. That's Golf with Jay Delsing featuring the biggest names in golf every Sunday morning from 8 to 10 on 101 ESPN. Hey, this is Jay Delsing for SSM Health Physical Therapy. Our golf program has the same screening techniques and technology as the pros on the PGA Tour use. SSM Health Physical Therapy has the Titleist Performance Institute trained physical therapists that can perform the TPI screening on you as well as use the KVEST 3D motion capture system. Proper posture, alignment, etc. can help you keep your game right down the middle. We have 80 locations in the St. Louis area. Call 800-518-1626 or visit them on the web at SSMPhysicalTherapy.com. Your therapy, our passion. Get ready to watch the legends of golf up close when they compete at historic Norwood Hills Country Club right here in St. Louis. The Ascension Charity Classic will be back again with some of golf's biggest names. Steve Stricker, Padre Harrington, John Daly, David Duvall, Bernard Longer, Ernie Els, and more will return September 3rd through the 8th at Norwood Hills. All tournament proceeds go to area charities serving North St. Louis County youth and families. Sponsorship opportunities, pro-am foursomes, and more information available for you at ascensioncharityclassic.com. I'm delighted to welcome the Amateur Players Tour to the Golf with Jay Delsing show. The APT team has worked so hard to establish a national golf tour for amateurs. Folks, don't miss out on this opportunity. If you love golf and ever wondered what all the fuss about tournament golf is, then this tour is for you. We just released the 2024 schedule and it is a beast. There's 21 events currently in the metropolitan St. Louis area with many more to come. But check out these golf courses. Paynes Valley, Ozark National, Stonewolf, Ambrier, Persimmon Woods, Gateway National, and a 36-hole event on Norwood's West Course, and many more. Okay, so the courses are certainly cool and nice, but what's really neat is the way the events are run and how they are run. The APT team does a fantastic job of closely monitoring handicaps and ensuring a good and fair competition. There are five divisions, a year-long points competition, major championships, elevated events, and much, much more. Right now, there are over 6,000 members in 41 different local chapters across the country. And all that's happened in just over five years. Join now and don't miss out on the best tournament golf in the country. Run for amateurs by amateurs themselves. Go to AmateurPlayersTour.com. That's AmateurPlayersTour.com. This is Adam Betts from Family Golf and Learning Center located in Kirkwood. Our motto is play your best golf. We have the best instruction for every skill level. Two female instructors along with our eight PGA instructors. We're there for the kids and the adults who are starting to play and trying to refine their game. Family Golf and Learning Center features a double-decker driving range, grass tees, and a short game area, along with indoor simulators and a performance center. That's not all. Don't forget about our back nine, Bar and Grill. Find out how we can help you and your family. Head to FamilyGolfOnline.com. That's FamilyGolfOnline.com. It's Family Golf and Learning Center, where we make St. Louis better at golf. 
Are you driving an out of warranty car? It's only a matter of time before your out of warranty vehicle is in the shop costing you thousands of dollars. Auto repair costs are up nearly 20% from last year, which is four times the rate of inflation. If an unexpected breakdown happened today, would you be ready for that? Well, now you can be with a plan through CarShield. Even if your car is just over three years old, it's still prone to expensive costs. Your car is more than just getting you from point A to point B. Traveling by car is a way of life. From picking up your kids to going to a new restaurant, cars are a daily essential. When you enroll in a car protection plan through CarShield, you can look forward to the following. The price will never go up no matter how many claims you file or no matter how high the mileage on your car increases. CarShield offers protection plans that start as low as $100 per month. That's $100 per month. They have repair coverage for up to 5,000 different parts of your vehicle. Plus, when your car breaks down and you're stuck on the side of the road, you get 24-7 coast-to-coast roadside assistance. You also get complimentary towing and rental car options. CarShield has my back when my car breaks down, and they can have yours too. Call CarShield today at 800 465 6550 or visit carshield.com. It's CarShield, proud sponsor of the Golf with Jay Delsing Show. down the stretch on Golf with Jay Delsing presented by Darty Business Solutions coming to you from the Car Shield Studios. We've heard from Jim Hackenberg. He is the founder of Orange Whip. That was in our number one. What a fun visit that was with Joey Vitale. Instant offense as he comes on a golf show. <laughs> Danny, how many when he said his dad would drive him by? His dad was, he, he, what did he say? He's Italian. He, he lays concrete. concrete. And he goes to church, and those are the only three things he did. Right. And he'd say, drive the family by a golf course, and he'd look over there and goes, look at all those lazy guys over there. <laughs> I thought that was fantastic. I'd love for him to meet Tiger Woods. I would, too. I bet he'd get in- involved in the game of golf. I bet he would, too, and I bet you I bet you he'd, uh, he might call Tiger something, but he sure as heck wouldn't call him lazy, would he? No, he wouldn't. <laughs> it's a tough sport. you got to put a lot of hours oh, into it. Oh, my gosh, it's so good. we got to get that man on the golf course. That's what I, got, I guarantee you. Because he's such a sportsman, he, all he's got to do is get that. You know, you know what it's like. That we could have the. This is the weird thing about golf that I absolutely love and kind of hate about it. You could have the worst day ever, and even on the last couple of holes, hit that one shot. Brings you back. It brings you back, man. Brings it you back. just it feels so good. It goes just how you see it in your mind's eye, and whether it even works out perfectly or not, is you're like. I'm going to do that again. So we played this past week. What if there yeah. isn't a shot that brings me back? <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> I had a rough day. Oh, I had I had some rough days as well. We, uh, yeah, it was a Delsing party. I threw the party <laughs> for you boys. Not, I'm not I'm not liking it. Joe's over in Cancun somewhere. Yeah, well, play all the, all the money there with our money. It. Yeah, um, yeah. There's a well. You know what? You know what it is. You're not going to stop playing. No. And neither am I. Because it's, it's like, I'll do better next time. Well, and the fun we have. It's yeah. not, I love what you say. Not how well you play, but the people you play with. No doubt. The time that you have with them to spend. 100%. Danny, if I could do this, you'd probably say the same thing. If I could do this again, if I could have my favorite foursome, my dad and my brother. I mean, if I could play one more round of golf with my dad, it would be better than having dinner with him. It'd be better, you know, I, if I could, I'll take anything if we could. You know, we both miss our dads quite a bit, but it's like, man, to, to get him on the golf course and all the stupid things and all the great times we had together and everything, it's just, it, it's fantastic. And that's what makes golf really special, I really think. Most pro athletes outside of golf say, I want to play with a PGA pro. I want to play with Jay Delsing. I want to play with Tiger Woods. Yeah. Was there somebody, though, that you wanted to play with in another sport and you thought, man, if I could get around with this guy, that would be a lot of fun? And I know you love hockey. You love baseball. There's got to be somebody probably from those two sports yeah. that come to mind. Yeah. My, 
Maybe the great one. My dad, I, I've met him. I've never got to play with the great Wayne. He is such a nice person. Uh, I've seen him play. I've, you know, sat on the driving range with him. I would love to play with him sometime. If you could throw it back, my dad's favorite baseball player of all time was Lou Gehrig. I, and I, Lou wasn't much of a, you know, a showman like the babe was. So, but maybe someone like that, Danny, and f- someone from our area, our era, I got to play a few holes with Michael Jordan up in Chicago. Oh, did you really? And that was super cool. That was. Did you, you talk much or was it more just playing? Uh, we talked a little bit, but it was not like you. Yeah. Okay. It was like, you stay over there. Uh-huh. You know what I mean? And look, I get it. I res- respect him. We're just, we, we didn't get enough. We didn't get to play enough where if I hit one, of, you know, I, sometimes I'll hit one of those shots where he'll want to go, okay, could you show me how to do that? <laughs> right. You know what I mean? It, it, we didn't get to that point. But I, uh, you know, I've gotten to play down at Grove 23 and he's there and the rule, their strict rule, just MJ's off limits. And so I'm cool. Yeah. And I'm not that star kind of guy and all that. But, I mean, to get to play golf with him, maybe gamble him with a little bit, I might need some backers um, because <laughs> he's probably playing games that might be out of our leagues. But yeah. um, I, I, I probably saw someone like him. So yeah. let's tip our cap. Yep. As we head down the stretch, tip of the cap is going to go towards uh, the folks at Orange Whip, and I know you want to specialize or at least highlight uh, Jim Hackenberg. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the our tip of the cap is brought to you by the Dean Team Volkswagen of Kirkwood, 314 uh, 969. <laughs> what am I doing? 314 I have called those guys so many times, I have a senior moment right when I need to do Give that. the number again. <laughs> DT Volkswagen of Kirkwood, 314 966 0303. That's our buddy, Colin Burt. He, he, uh, they, they sponsor the tip of the cap, and we so appreciate them. Their vehicles are fantastic. Any sort of vehicle you need, folks, they have got it at DT Volkswagen of Kirkwood. I'm tipping my cap to Jim Hackenberg and guys like Jim Hackenberg who, who are golf lovers at heart they love the game and spend all of this time you you could hear how much passion he had for the game for his equipment and how he got in his garage and he's got a fishing pole on one end and some weights on the other end and and i just love that and when you're when you love something so much you do some crazy crazy things for it and so we're tipping our cap to orange whip and jim hackenberg and the orange whip uh uh training and and guys like that And that's brought to you by dean team volkswagen of kirkwood some emails coming in jay at jdelsingolf.com as we have a few minutes left this is patty in west county which major is your favorite? I love this uh, question. Okay, so when I was a kid, I loved, so, only two for me. It was the U.S. Open and the Masters. U.S. And I always wanted to win the U.S. Open just because I thought I'm a U.S. citizen. It's got the U.S. in the United States in the title. I want to be the United States Open champion. And it's wide open. It's wide open. It's anybody involved. It's like, it's like gimme golf. Everyone welcome, yep. you know? And so um, I love that. But as I got older, Danny, and I got to experience Augusta, the mystique, the, the uh, I, my friends used to give me so much grief as a young guy going, green jacket? Like, <laughs> right. who, who wants a green, who gives a dang about a green jacket? And I'm like, I do. Yeah, I'll no take kidding. One. Yeah, so to be able to, to join a list of the players that won, either one of those two, that's me. I would take that in a heartbeat and run. I'm with you on the U.S. Open because it's. if I wanted to try to qualify this summer, I could do it. I know. Now I'll get my butt kicked, but yeah, I could at least okay. try. Yeah. I could at least try. Yep. All right, South City, this is Mike. One tourney for Jay Delsing to win, what would it be? Oh, that's a great question, Mike. So Maybe the U.S. Open or the Masters. Right, so we're going to leave the majors out. Yeah. When I first got on tour, we played a tournament at Kings Mill, and it was the Anheuser-Busch Golf Classic, and that was a major for me. All I got acquainted with all the A.B. guys, Orion Burkhart, his wife used to run junior golf when I was a kid, and they were just unbelievable people. Now, that fell off the schedule after about five years and then we went to uh, the John Deere which was in 
uh, Quad Cities, and it's as close to a home event, Danny, as we're going to get. Midwestern people, the guys are sitting there watching you play golf, eating pork chop sandwiches. Are you kidding me? <laughs> That's my kind of tournament. So I would say probably John Deere was was super special. Um, if you could take a major, I want the, I think I want the Masters yeah. over the U.S. Open now, but I'd take any and all of those. How about Ryan in Illinois? He says, favorite part of your game, what is it, Jay? I love the short game. I love uh, my short game is a little frozen, right? Little, my, little suspect my of what I normally game see. Is not good, people. My short game sucks right now. I haven't had any time to practice. I'm going to come up with a million excuses, but the bottom line is usually I'll chip it close, occasionally chip one in. Right now, I'm barely chipping it on. Is that right? It's true. <laughs> I've seen you chip better. Yeah, That's all yeah, I'm going to say. Yeah. So I, the chipping and the pitching part is my favorite, Ryan. I love, I love the the feel of that. I love you. You, we spent just a little bit of time. You are extremely gracious about not wanting to take any lessons from me, which really ticks me off. But anyway, you're chipping and pitching. Because you're out there to play. I know, but you're chipping and pitching got so much you better at the beginning of the year. You big time. Yeah, so that's that's the thing that really can hold your game together because you're not always gonna, going to hit it well, and so you're going to need to figure out how to chip in the pitch and the putt. How about the drills? You talked about putting drills. What did you do for chipping drills to soften your hands? Yep. The things that you do yep. that you do so well with chipping. R- right, it's, it's a different motion guys and it's one of these motions where your midsection and on a full golf swing once you want to separate the low lower body from the upper body and lead with your lower body in the short game you want them to come through together the closer think of it this way guys the closer you get to the hole the softer the less power the more precision we want when you're on the tee we want power no precision Guys on the PGA Tour don't give a darn about hitting the fairway. Scott Fawcett, Decade Golf, tells you, hit it down there as far as you can. We want speed and power off the tee and everything else. The closer we get, look at the way the best putters in the world putt. Nothing fast, nothing jerky, Danny. Smooth, soft, and get that ball rolling. Leads into our final email of this morning, and it's Dawn from Illinois again. And that is a, uh, a, a bunker sand shot coming from, let's say, the right side of the green. And you've got to get it to the far left. Okay. Okay. You understand yeah. what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don, I know. I think I know what you mean. So you got a longish bunker exactly. shot. It's not, you didn't short side yourself. So you don't have this big high lip that you have to go over. And so you, the problem is, the length. How do we get the length? And Don, what I'm going to suggest is just simply switch from your 60 or your most lofted degree wedge to your middle wedge and do exactly the same thing. Now, chances are you're not going to have the same amount of bounce on your middle wedge as you will on your 60. So it's going to take a little bit of adjustment. You more than likely will have to get maybe a little closer to the ball with that 54 and just work it out. But chances are if your technique is reasonably reasonably well, you, good and sound, you're going to just have to switch clubs and that just going from a 60 degree to say a 55 that extra five degrees on the club will will give you almost an extra 15 or 20 feet and it should take care of that for you a lot of people struggle getting out of bunkers don't they oh danny i have more people call me the two things i hear the most i never hear anything about can you help me with my putting right all i hear about is how can you help me hit it further and how can i get out of the sand yep and they don't want to get close to the hole they want just out. Just get me out. Just get me out. <laughs> they just want to get out of the sand, yeah. Hey, this has been a great show, Jay, as always. And our thanks to Jim Hackenberg. Also, Joey Vitale will do it again next Sunday right here on 101 ESPN from 8 to 10. And, Jay, how do we end the show? Hit them straight, St. Louis. Darty Business Solutions has been enhancing the business of our customers for the last 37 years. How do we do it? Through our expertise in technology, better use of data and analytics, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. We roll up our sleeves and collaborate. We build applications and effectively communicate with our partner clients to bring their goals and objectives to the finish line. Our award-winning Access Point program is a community game changer. With nearly 100 students in the program, mostly young African-American females, 
are making between fifty-five and sixty thousand dollars per year right out of high school. That's right, fifty-five to sixty thousand dollars a year right after high school graduation. That's when they begin their training. CEO Ron Darty believes the talent is equally distributed, but access to that opportunity is not. So here's Access Point, providing more and more opportunity for those in and around our community. It's Darty Business Solutions. Hey, St. Louis, Eddie McVeigh here from Maggie O'Brien's. When you head downtown for a concert or cards or blues game, and now for the St. Louis City soccer game, please come see us at Maggie O'Brien's before and after your event. Take our shuttle to and from or stay in-house and watch your favorite team on our multiple high-def TVs. We look forward to seeing you soon at one of our two locations in Sunset Hills on South Lindbergh or downtown at the corner of Market and 20th Street. Union Station is next to us. Redbird Heating and Cooling sponsors the Veterans Vocational Apprentice Program. Jed Dickinson, a retired Navy man, will teach, mentor, and sign off on educational and mechanical work hours to help you get fully licensed while you work and get paid by the company. What a great way to launch your career as a fully licensed HVAC specialist. Call Redbird Heating and Cooling today at 314-320-9507. That's Redbird Heating and Cooling. Family Golf and Learning Center. No matter your age or skill level, Family Golf and Learning Center, located in Kirkwood, has something for you. They've got it all. PGA and LPGA instruction, double-decker driving range, par-3 golf course, trackman simulators, a large short-game green design to help you with all your shots around the green, bunkers, rough, and Zoysia fairway pitching. And now open the Tahoma Bermuda Grass Tees, the best turf to hit from in St. Louis. It's all at Family Golf and Learning Center. To schedule a lesson or to find out more, visit FamilyGolfOnline.com. That's FamilyGolfOnline.com. Family Golf and Learning Center. We make St. Louis better at golf. Are you driving an out-of-warranty car? It's only a matter of time before your out-of-warranty vehicle is in the shop costing you thousands of dollars. Auto repair costs are up nearly 20% from last year, which is four times the rate of inflation. If an unexpected breakdown happened today, would you be ready for that? Well, now you can be with a plan through CarShield. Even if your car is just over three years old, it's still prone to expensive costs. Your car is more than just getting you from point A to point B. Traveling by car is a way of life. From picking up your kids to going to a new restaurant, cars are a daily essential. When you enroll in a car protection plan through CarShield, you can look forward to the following. The price will never go up no matter how many claims you file or no matter how high the mileage on your car increases. CarShield offers protection plans that start as low as $100 per month. That's $100 per month. They have repair coverage for up to 5,000 different parts of your vehicle. Plus, when your car breaks down and you're stuck on the side of the road, you get 24-7 coast-to-coast roadside assistance. You also get complimentary towing and rental car options. CarShield has my back when my car breaks down, and they can have yours too. Call CarShield today at 800 465 6550 or visit carshield.com. It's CarShield, proud sponsor of the Golf with Jay Delsing Show. For the best in Italian cuisine in St. Louis, look no further than Paul Mano's, located in Chesterfield. It's traditional Italian cooking, and their best ingredient, it's their tradition. It's cooking like Paul's grandmother used to make and like his mother still prepares today. There are no corners cut at Paul Mano's, from greeting you at the door to the pasta you'll share with your family. Paul Mano's is committed to bringing you their very best anytime you share a meal at their place. It's Paul Mano's located in Chesterfield. I'm delighted to welcome the Amateur Players Tour to the Golf with Jay Delsing show. The APT team has worked so hard to establish a national golf tour for amateurs. Folks, don't miss out on this opportunity. If you love golf and ever wondered what all the fuss about tournament golf is, then this tour is for you. We just released the 2024 schedule and it is a beast. There's 21 events 
currently in the metropolitan St. Louis area with many more to come. But check out these golf courses. Paynes Valley, Ozark National, Stone Wolf, Ambrier, Persimmon Woods, Gateway National, and a 36-hole event on Norwood's West Course, and many more. Okay, so the courses are certainly cool and nice, but what's really neat is the way the events are run and how they are run. The APT team does a fantastic job of closely monitoring handicaps and ensuring a good and fair competition. There are five divisions, a year-long points competition, major championships, elevated events, and much, much more. Right now, there are over 6,000 members in 41 different local chapters across the country. And all that's happened in just over five years. Join now and don't miss out on the best tournament golf in the country. Run for amateurs by amateurs themselves. Go to amateurplayerstour.com. That's amateurplayerstour.com. <laughs> 